Let me state uh, first what a joy it is to be moderating the first plenary session of the Asia Pacific Housing Forum. Uh, it's really an honor, particularly with this distinguished panel. Um, and the topic that we are going to be addressing is the poverty, housing, water, and energy nexus. And this panel is going to be asked to address how housing policies and housing programs can serve as an integrating platform to address the different dimensions of poverty. This is a forward-looking question, but there's a great deal of historic experience on the, on the stage with me. Um, and I think you'll have a great, uh, great time. We're going to start with just a few introductory remarks, um, and then we'll go to a Q&A that I will lead, and then we will have a, an open floor. So start thinking about your questions. You and I all know that housing and poverty are linked. We heard the Vice President speak so eloquently about that today. And housing policies and programs can either exacerbate poverty or, in fact, can help contribute to breaking the cycle of poverty. Unfortunately, too often, poverty interventions are fragmented and compartmentalized. So going forward, how do we look for new solutions? And this is the panel that will help us get there. Uh, immediately to my right is Henry Cisneros. Of course, he's sitting out of order for my notes, so it, there you go. Um, Henry is the former secretary of the Housing and Urban Development for the country of the United States, and he is now executive chairman of CityView. Um, a little known fact is that he shares an honor with the Vice President of both of them having served as mayors of important cities. In Henry's case, the mayor of San Antonio, Texas. Uh, to his right is Secretary Corazon Solomon, also known as Dinky. When I asked her what I should call her, she said, if you call me Dinky, uh, people will know who you're talking about. If you call me anything else, they won't. I'm not sure anybody knows my family name. So, Dinky, thank you for being with us. Um, as most of you know, Dinky is the Secretary of the Philippines Department of Social Welfare and Development. What you may or may not know is that the mandate of that agency is to oversee social protection and poverty reduction solutions for the poor. Uh, Dinky comes to this important position with many years, including having created a coalition of 1,600 NGOs. So if you thought she was walking on water, being in the government, you know her experience was getting all those NGOs together to cooperate. Almost impossible, but she lived to tell the tale. <laughs> Dinky will have to leave at 10 o'clock, and I'm allowed to tell you why. She is leaving for budget hearings. So it's not just any old thing. Budget is about the most important to the work that she's doing. Um, she will be uh, substituted or, uh, by her assistant secretary, J.V. Jimenez, um, who's working alongside her in the program. So she will make the remarks and answer certain questions. Um, and then J.V. will be available to follow through um, with representing the department. Um, to Dinky's right. Um, is my new friend and former dinner partner last night, um, Yoshi Fukasawa. Um, Yoshi is at UN Habitat, and he's the director of the regional office for Asia and the Pacific. For those of us that work around the world with UN Habitat, that's a gigantic job, and he's in a really important role. And he's in a particularly important role as UN Habitat faces into their p positions on the Millennium Development Goals, and as they develop Habitat 3, which is a 20-plus year agenda for housing and settlements going forward. So we're really honored to have Yoshi with us. Uh, and finally, um, to my far right, is Dr. Yu Tai Ker. Uh, tai Ker is closest to Tiger, so if anybody has trouble remembering, it's Tiger, Tai Ker. Um, and he looks like a very young man, and he is, but in his very earliest phase, 
he actually worked on developing the concept plan for Singapore. And it, Singapore is such a, a, a transformative model in the whole world of housing around, but it had to be start someplace, and it started at the concept plan. Then, as if that were not enough, he took on for 20 years the role as CEO of the HDB, which is the Housing Development Board of Singapore. He is now director of RSP, he's an architect and planning group, and he is chairman of the advisory board for the center of livable cities. So welcome to this wonderful panel. Um, again, we are going to be focusing on the housing policies and the way it interfaces with the different dimensions of poverty. Um, before we proceed um, with my asking questions, uh, I'd like to invite each of our panelists to issue a brief statement on the work they're doing. Now, they're all doing immense amounts of work, so they will be asked to focus on how the work they're doing relates to this topic. So, Henry, if I may start with you. Liz, thank you very much. Uh, secretary Soleiman, um, one of the, the things about the Secretary is that she's been very active in the last two weeks in the uh, civil disturbance, the violence that occurred in the southern part of the nation and uh, was rec recounting to us today the hands-on, urgent work she's doing in rebuilding uh, housing for 100,000 displaced persons in that part of the Philippines. I think we owe her a special respect for her leadership and her work in these last days. Dr. Tyker and Mr. Fukusawa, um, I'm honored to be part of a panel with you and of course with Liz, whose work I watch <clears throat> as the Chief Legal Officer for Habitat for Humanity International. You can imagine what a big job that is. Um, I'd like to begin just by restating the premise of this panel, which is that housing is a platform for breaking the cycle of poverty. And that raises the first question, I think. The first, the first issue is, are we serious as societies about breaking the cycle of poverty? In too many countries, the concept is paid lip service, but the numbers remain. The inequality remains. And so I think it's worth, in starting a panel like this, just to say uh, how important it is for a country to commit itself to reducing poverty. Why? First, because a nation cannot prosper if it is pulled back by the debilitating forces of high poverty. Um, massive resources must be addressed to the problem. The country cannot be perceived as a, a forward-looking, progressive country if poverty remains large and if there's not a commitment to addressing poverty. Secondly, poverty is a source of instability within the country. People are unhappy. There's vast degrees of income inequality leads to crime, leads to violence, leads to a sense of unfairness, leads to breakaway movements. It's hard to imagine a modern country that can create the stability necessary in a sophisticated world to progress, carrying on its shoulders a large burden of poverty. Thirdly, there is the potential loss of human talent, of human capability. We just lose too many people who would be great artists, great engineers, great leaders, uh, great literary figures. All of the things that we want out of a society if we leave people in the backwaters of poverty. Fourthly, the path to a modern society is to have the strong backbone of a middle class. Many emerging countries have a a, a, a small but very wealthy upper class, a narrow middle class, and then a large base at the bottom of the pyramid of people who are very poor. That is not a pathway to prosperity. A, a, a vehicle for, for moving people from poverty to the middle class is essential. And finally, I would say, we address poverty because it is the right thing to do. It is hard to have a concept 
of a civilized society, of respect for other human beings, of bridging the divisions, ethnic, tribal, national, income, if we don't have a strategy overtly committed, a serious strategy, one that can be perceived as effective to addressing poverty. So I think the first premise is, yes, we are serious about trying to address poverty, and I would argue the other part of this statement here, listed up here, is that, is that housing is a platform for getting there. I think there's a lot of logic to that. When you stop and think about how we break this knot of poverty, it's a very complex thing, it's a very hard thing, rooted in generations, even hundreds of years, but it involves education, which is a very difficult thing, conveying knowledge from one generation to the next. It involves training and preparation for livelihood in the workplace. It involves health. All of these things require, first and foremost, a stable place to live. So it is very difficult to imagine how a child can learn if they don't have a stable place, if they're living in a chaotic and unsafe structure. Very difficult to know how a family advances its livelihood. How does it learn the habits of workplace discipline without a physical structure that is safe and decent? We know that in crowd, overcrowded housing, unsafe housing, there are unhealthy conditions. Uh, everything from uh, minor viruses to more extensive epidemics as a result of unclean, undecent housing. So all of these things depend upon a commitment to the concept of housing first. Not housing alone. Housing has to be done in collaboration with many other partners for many other purposes. But housing first, because every single night, poor people face the basic question, where are we going to sleep? Where are our children, our babies, going to lay their head tonight? Will it be safe? Will it be healthy? Is it a place that we can even dream about a future? So I want to commend all of you who are involved in the housing field, and, uh, and we'll talk more in this panel about the kind of collaboration that it re requires. Um, collaboration, as the Vice President said, across the new three Ps, the public sector, the private sector, and the people sector, bringing together the capacities of government, of corporations, of high net worth families, of citizens as residents, of volunteers, uh, but all working to underscore the role of housing uh, in breaking the cycle of poverty. Liz. Thank you so much, Henry. Wonderful remarks. Uh, Dinky, uh, please go ahead. Good morning, colleagues here in the stage and uh, colleagues out there in the audience. First, on policy, uh, the policy is inclusive development and that people first, the people are our bosses. The programs, I'd like to cite three. Uh, we would like to, I'd like to tell you our experience in working with the most vulnerable and marginalized in the city, the street families. The street families who have no houses. Uh, they live on uh, carts, they live on uh, what we call tricycle, these are uh, three-wheel uh, carts. And what we are doing is what we call the Department of Social Welfare and Development Modified Conditional Cash Transfer. So the Modified Conditional Cash Transfer provides uh, cash for education that the children go to school 85% of the time and health grant for the mothers to go to health centers as opposed to just being on the street. But the third aspect of this, which um, many of the conditional cash transfers have not yet explored into, is that we provide shelter fund for the government to rent uh, for six months a room or a house so that they can be moved out of the street. And as we do that, we provide livelihood intervention in the hope that, and most of the time it, it happens, that after six months they can continue to pay for the rent and or amortization of the place that we initially rented for them for six months. 
Uh, one quick story here is that a vagrant who sleeps in our park, the Luneta Park, uh, we gave the work of being a park cleaner and now is renting an apartment with her family where before they used to live in the park. The second uh, example of translating policy into programs is the program for the informal settlers in Manila where we are developing near site or in-city relocation. And it's a challenge, and it's a challenge I want to give to all of you. It's, bring, it's really looking at sites by the river, three meter off the easement, designing micro buildings so that they are not far from their livelihood. But in so doing, uh, the issue of land ownership, the issue of uh, disaster risk reduction management, the issue of uh, access to all these places have come to fore, and we're working on that, and my assistant secretary is our focal for that. The third example I'd like to give is the challenge that uh, Mr. Cisneros had said in Sambuanga City, where I think was, what is important, aside from rebuilding the structures, is building the shelter with the culture in mind. We have a group of people there who had been displaced whose main uh, habitat is by the sea, uh, which is basically uh, our Sama Bajaos, with some of the countries here having the same. And the challenge is how do you design a coastal settlement with the necessary sanitation, with the necessary access, away from the storm surges, with people's uh, values intact, with people's culture intact, but at the same time free from the risk of disaster. So these are some of the challenges that we face. We're, we're talking about, as uh, Mr. Cisnero said, 118,000 displaced individuals, and about 30% of them are coastal. Uh, coast, they have been living in the coastal area. So again, we welcome suggestions on design. We look forward to working with Habitat for Humanity. We are going to do groundbreaking on Saturday with the Habitat for Humanity in one of the areas. So at the end of this, what I'd like to say is the policy and program is guided by two principles. It's basically convergence, convergence of people in government putting together our resources, the different agencies, convergence with private sector, convergence with civil society organization. But the second principle, which is the most important, as already cited by the Vice President and Mr. Cisneros, is people, people's voice and vote that they are part of the decision making as well as in the implementation and in monitoring and evaluation the whole program. So those are my thoughts for the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. That's wonderful. Excuse me. Excuse me. Thank you. See you. <coughs> Thank you. I'm sure we're Sorry to miss any further insights, but we wish you well, Dinky, with your budget. <laughs> yeah. And J.V. Jimenez has joined us on the stage. Um, Yoshi, may I ask you to go ahead and make a statement, please? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Uh, as uh, Liz has uh, int int uh, introduced, uh, I work in the United Nations uh, Human Settlements Program. Uh, in short, the organization's name is UN Habitat. UN Habitat, not Unhabitat. We are very much Habitat. <laughs> <laughs> and our, the mandate of our, of our agency is a, a, a we, we consider ourselves as a housing agency, a slum upgrading, and shelter agencies. That is uh, the, 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 the whole purpose uh, for which our organization was created. And uh, the motto of this agency is, at the moment, adequate shelter for all, which was endorsed by the Istanbul Conference of 20, 1995. And as Liz uh, indicated, we are waiting for uh, the next, this uh, kind of big meeting, which is uh, Habitat 3 in 2016. And uh, we are in the uh, process of making preparation for that. And, uh, 
so the UN habitat is within the UN families, like UNICEF does children and vice versa. UN, within UN habitat, uh, UN, UN agency uh, families, we are a uh, housing agency. And I am a Mr. Housing of the UN. I uh, would like to uh, share with you uh, my very humble experience in Sri Lanka, where we undertake a on the ground operation, on the ground projects of uh, providing shelters and uh, community infrastructures, infrastructures to the war torn zone of uh, Sri Lanka. In the northern part of Sri Lanka, there was a, a kind of conflict uh, took place uh, and ended. And uh, in the course of the conflict, uh, over 100,000 people were evacuated and they, they went on IDP, into, 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 into displaced person. And then the war ended and they came back. But the houses were completely destroyed and the people didn't know what to do. Then we mobilized funds and we are now providing housing and also infrastructure. And we target the most vulnerable family, which are many cases women-headed households because the husband was killed and the son was got injured, etc., etc., in the war. And uh, we, I, had, I, I went there and I had an opportunity to be invited to an inauguration ceremony of a newly developed house. The methodology of uh, our intervention is exactly what, uh, how uh, uh, Secretary Solomon uh, uh, stated. Uh, we go through, we apply what we call people's process. We don't pro, uh, develop our house and give it to the people. We don't do that. We, invite and facilitate people to get together and come up with their own uh, priorities and uh, we make contract and we facilitate them to implement their priorities including of course housing and uh, through this process uh, the community and people and the community are also empowered uh, in addition to the physical achievement of uh, something which needs to be done and uh, now this is uh, uh, inauguration ceremony I was invited and uh, the lady uh, who is actually heading the, he was he heading the uh, household invited us to go into the house and there was a kind of sh little shrine and uh, put some uh, uh, candles and uh, I was given a kind of flower like this and the lady was so happy the lady was so happy I had never seen a people who are who have uh, so who are so happy, who were smiling and in such a happy face, and uh, she was uh, is, uh, from her bottom from the bottom of her uh, heart. She said that now I can begin my uh, I can begin to rebuild my life. After the war, it's been already a couple of years, but uh, she has not been able to uh, commence her. Uh, own reconstruction of, of her life, but now she can commence her life, uh, commence her to rebuild their, her life. This is very important in the context of reconstruction because reconstruction people tend to think that we provide infrastructure and uh, vice versa, physical, uh, civic support we provide and vice versa. But at the end of the day, the engine of the reconstruction is not the physical infrastructure, but the people. Unless people become energized, and unless people become forward-looking, reconstruction cannot be done. Uh, so we provide, uh, well, it's not we, it's a international community uh, provide uh, housing to the most vulnerable family, and uh, finally they are now able to uh, have a forward-looking vision and commence their uh, reconstruction of their own life. So, I really resonate, would like to resonate uh, Mr. Sinores. Sorry, I couldn't pronounce your name. <laughs> <laughs> housing is the, the platform uh, for uh, tomorrow and the alleviation of the poverty. And uh, this is the source of my energy. Uh, uh, working in the UN is not an easy thing. Sometimes we need to face a lot of a bureaucracy, etc., etc. But uh, this gives me an energy to fight. And uh, 
uh, in the beginning, I said that we are waiting for Habitat 3 2016 to reconfirm the importance of housing, the issue of housing, especially in the context of rapid urbanization taking place in many parts of the world. And uh, uh, housing in a correct, uh, appropriate sense, uh, housing cannot be cannot stand on its own. It has to be uh, positioned in, within the broader context, context like uh, within community, within rapid urbanization, in a, in, a broader, in a broader context. So we need to ensure to mainstream or re-mainstream the issue of uh, important issue of housing in this uh, important uh, international discussion. Uh, part of that is also uh, discussion towards uh, post-2015 uh, international commitment. That is another important dis discussion which, is, which we need also need to uh, address. And for all of us to ensure to mainstream the important issue of housing, I really welcome this kind of occasion. And in fact, we, read, we work very closely with Habitat for Humanity in many occasions and take this opportunity to express my thanks to that too. And uh, I really welcome this occasion and uh, I urge, to, I urge, urge to, uh, all of you to get together and uh, collect our power to uh, make our voice correctly to the international community. Dr. Liu. A good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I thought I would start off by letting you know what Singapore has done through public housing. It may sound a little bit boastful, but the in intention is not that. The intention is to let you know that it, these things can be done. So what have we done? In 1960, we had 1.3 million people living in squatters out of 1.9 million in the total city. And by 1985, we had no more squatters, no more homeless, no more poverty ghettos, no more uh, ethnic enclaves within 25 years. And so the statistics as of today is that with 1 million Darling units in public housing, we house 82% of the population, 93% of total population own their own homes, and in public housing for a period of 25 years when I was the CEO, the satisfaction rate was 95%. Now, I, I'm painting this uh, to say that, well, maybe given